We're delighted to welcome you all here today to our second annual New Jersey State of Health uh, 2012. Many of you were here last year, and if you were here last year, you may recall that uh, we got such a wonderful reaction to last year's conference, people asked if we were planning to do it again this year. So our uh, motto at the Council on State Public Affairs is we always give the customers what they want. Uh, and because we really couldn't say that a lot of progress had been made on health care since the conference last year either. Uh, in fact, health care continues to, uh, to be one of the most complex and compelling public policy issues that we face, both in New Jersey and across the country. And we're fortunate today to have speakers assembled on all of our panels who are certainly well known in New Jersey, but who also provide insight and wisdom to, uh, to organizations and panels across the country. Uh, they're really all national speakers as well as New Jersey speakers. A couple of housekeeping details to take care of before we begin. Um, first of all, we want to thank our sponsors who made this program possible. We, we know we have attendees here today from MD Advantage, from the Nicholson Foundation, and from uh, New Jersey manufacturers. So please join me in thanking our sponsors because they make all this happen. Secondly, I would ask you all just to check your programs for the bios of the participants. Um, as I mentioned, they're all well-known and uh, eminently qualified to participate this morning. In the interest of time, we won't do introductions. The, uh, the, each moderator will simply identify the participants so you'll know who they are, uh, but we encourage you to read the bios that are listed in the program. Uh, there is one substitution. We learned last night, unfortunately, that Assemblyman Greenwald will not be able to be with us today, but they did step in and find a replacement, and Assemblyman Dan Benson, who is the Vice Chair of the Assembly House, Health and Senior Services Committee will be here to participate in the second panel. So with that, uh, we're about, I think we're ready to get started with the program. Um, some of you have also asked about attendee lists, and those will be emailed to all of you at the conclusion of the conference. So at this point, let me introduce Margaret Kohler, who is the Executive Director of the State Health Policy Center at Rutgers University. And Margaret, thank you for participating, for moderating today, and we'll let you get started. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'll introduce the, my uh, panelists here on my right. I think you know everybody here, but Wardell Sanders is the um, president of the New Jersey Association of Health Plans. To my left is um, Assemblyman Herb Conaway, who is the chair of the Assembly Health Committee. And then on the far left is Enrique Balagar, who is the vice president for Health Insurance Exchange Solutions at Xerox Government Healthcare Solutions. So we'll get started um, with you, Assemblyman Conaway, in terms of your comments with uh, the, uh, Governor Christie vetoed the legislation last week. Can you comment on what your thoughts were? Was it a surprise what we can expect over the summer in terms of legislative process and next steps? Thank you, good morning, everybody. Um, you know, uh, you are obviously correct that the uh, governor has vetoed um, uh, this is a legislative effort at uh, the exchange. Um, as you know, uh, federal law requires uh, that exchanges be established across the country uh, in respect of that federal uh, or national health reform. And states have, uh, will choose uh, to either form their own exchange or have the federal government run it or work in partnership with the federal government depending on what the state chooses to do. It has been the policy of the previous governor and this governor, as I understand it, that New Jersey should run its own exchange. And in accordance with that, um, a bill was put forward, sponsored by uh, myself and, uh, and the Assembly and, uh, and Senator Nia Gill in the Senate uh, that um, really incorporated many of the measures that were cited as best practices uh, by uh, national bodies looking at these exchanges and how they want to be put together uh, by states. Uh, it has a governing board uh, to uh, run it, uh, an eight-member board. There's an advisory uh, board as well. Uh, we uh, felt uh, that uh, we ought to have some strong uh, post-employment restrictions in that. Uh, I had a big concern about uh, what we see in our own government with people cycling in and out of government, doing things when they're on a government post, now cycling back to industry. Uh, to, um, to now work in an industry that they previously regulated. And I see that as not a particularly, um, that a measure that endures a good government. I think that we ought to have people serving in these positions that are uh, as free as we can possibly make them of, uh, of uh, special interest influence. I think as the special interest influence goes up, uh, the concern about what happens to consumers uh, and how consumers are treated before the government 
uh, goes down. And so I thought as we were establishing something new, why not set that as a paradigm uh, in uh, the exchange? We put strong consumer protections in there. We made sure, of course, that the exchange followed uh, the federal uh, dictates in terms of reporting and other measures. We listened uh, to um, hospitals and others who were concerned about uh, the fact that uh, the exchange ought to have the same kind of, of uh, policies offered inside and outside the exchange to avoid selection issues. Uh, the business community uh, uh, told us that they were very concerned, and of course it's part of the federal law, to have uh, a place to bring their employees so that they can have access to the same, um, to, to lower their costs. It's a big cost of doing, businesses, uh, doing business for our small business businesses. We have heard this over and over again. We certainly know that individuals uh, and others who currently are not able to afford insurance need uh, some place to go to get good information that will allow them to make the choices that are best for them in their particular circumstances, what their budget is, what they need out of insurance, and to have a mechanism for providing the subsidies that will allow them to purchase affordable insurance. So, you know, we put uh, all of those good government measures in there, open uh, public meetings, um, broad um, participation by um, all stakeholders, uh, and uh, the hope was, of course, that uh, we might uh, find uh, that uh, this effort met with the governor's approval. Now, well, I'm surprised that um, uh, the bill was vetoed. Now, I, I think people told me over and over again that this probably was going to happen, uh, but you know, we have, uh, I think, a responsibility in the legislature to. Um, to make, uh, you know, we're a co-equal branch. <laughs> and it is our responsibility to put forth a proposal that we think meets the needs of our, uh, of our constituents. So, uh, you know, we're going to move forward with that. Now, uh, it is, um, live in a democracy, it's a republic, and we have, uh, have a give and take, obviously, between the executive and the legislative branch. We're going to have to engage in some uh, negotiations over the final uh, scope of uh, the legislation. Um, but, uh, you know, that process will come as it comes. Clearly the veto and awaiting the court decision um, will sort of set the time frame for getting back to that. What I hope does not happen is that we'll see a, um, uh, this governor doing what governors have done in some other states and try to establish this by some sort of executive uh, order. I think that that would be um, a mistake. And um, uh, I... Well, let's just hope that that doesn't happen. I want to take the opportunity, and I know we have to get on to others, just, just to address some things which I've um, seen in the press which I find um, uh, concerning. One is that we are uh, sort of uh, foisting upon the public this, uh, this uh, I guess, huge bureaucracy. I've seen that over and over and over again in the press. I, I do wonder how something like an exchange with all of the various functions the federal government requires us to do um, it can be done uh, without having some kind of bureaucratic mechanism around it. You know, the computers which will uh, have a lot to do uh, uh, with, uh, and the software programs that are written, or how this exchange runs, still needs the input of people who are making policy to tell the computers what to do. I mean, it's, it's, the little fairies are not sort of going to come out and, and sort of make up, uh, you know, the various rules of the road that are going to govern how this exchange works. And so there are going to need to be people there who are, um, who are focused keenly on the public interest to, to write the policy rules which will allow the machines uh, to do what human beings uh, want uh, the machines to do as regards uh, this exchange. And so I have been somewhat surprised by that. Now, it might be a more, um, I think, appropriate argument to say, well, if we're going to have a bureaucracy, why not let the feds do it? Because you might get some efficiencies of scale. Um, uh, we'll have sort of, a, sort of a common platform across the country. Many of the uh, insurance companies are national companies, and perhaps it might make more sense for them to deal with, you know, less variations of, of these exchanges across the country. And that would, to me, would be uh, an argument that makes sense. Uh, but to decry the bill as this, uh, as, as that we're forming bureaucracy, and of course, you can't really do it without having some bureaucracy, without having some human beings involved in it, uh, uh, struck me as, a, as sort of surprising. The other concern uh, that was raised was, uh, th that the governor raised in his comments, was about the, the fact that the people on the board were going to be paid. Now, one of the things we heard in our caucus as this bill was debated was that, uh, you know, there's going to be some impact to the, the budget. Well, no. This, uh, this money, about $250,000, is money that's going to come from the industry that's going to be uh, running the exchange. The federal government's providing money for, this, uh, for these salaries. And given the uh, post-employment restrictions in there, it seemed reasonable to me, and we heard in testimony and committee, uh, that uh, given the expertise that was required, that it was reasonable 
uh, to give some kind of compensation to these people who are going to have a, a tremendous workload and, um, and have to um, bring a tremendous amount of expertise, and expertise usually costs money, uh, that was reasonable, not burden in the taxpayers. It wasn't going to come out of the general fund, but out of the industry that was going to benefit. And I think um, the other issue that's raised is the whole question of, of governance. And, and I was you know, very keen to ensure uh, that, uh, that you didn't have, when you consider there are going to be tens of millions of dollars flowing through the uh, insurance industry, that they were not going to have control over how this money flowed to them. I mean, that, that seems to me a, rep, a recipe for, um, for a bad government. You know, self-regulation gets you oil spills in the Gulf, it gets people killed in mines. It is not the way, in my view, to go that some disinterested parties with expertise ought to be there looking out keenly for the public interest and should not be in a position to basically determine how they're going to be paid uh, taxpayer money. Uh, and so uh, we're going to certainly insist and try to defend that position as we move forward uh, on uh, this legislation. Uh, I hope uh, whether, when the court will make its determination, I guess, remains to be seen. Uh, as you know, we're in the budget, throws the budget process now. Um, we could get something whipped up pretty quickly when we have to, but whether or not uh, we will, um, uh, the court will decide what it needs to decide and, and time for us to digest the implications of the decision and then make uh, responsible decisions on legislation before we break for the summer, I think is unlikely. I don't think we're going to have a special session, which means we're going to be pushed into September. And as you, uh, many of you know, is that we're sort of getting right up against it in terms of, of getting this thing uh, in, uh, bringing this thing into being, getting the regulations written. Now we put some expedited rulemaking in there in respect of the time crunch that we're under. Um, so that we can get this thing up, exercised, and ready to go for uh, to meet the uh, dictates of uh, national health reform. So those are my comments. I look forward to uh, people's questions on this and other matters as we go forward. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Simon Conway. Ward, um, with regard to the three issues specifically in the bill that the governor highlighted in his veto message, it was the active and passive purchasing. Um, talking about the uncertainty with regard to the cost of the basic health plan and the governance issue of the um, uh, paying the members of the board. Can you describe a little bit, you know, your members' position, really what your thoughts are in terms of some of the key provisions and what you would like to see, the members of the association would like to see moving forward as uh, assuming, you know, in the summer that there's more work to be done? Can you hear me now? Okay, great. So uh, uh, first I wanted to thank Becky for inviting me back uh, this year. Uh, as I noted last year, and this room is, I'm very fond of this room, uh, Richard Simmons uh, had a presentation here uh, and he asked everybody with a red tie to come up and dance on stage. Um, so thankfully you won't have to see me dance this year. Um, but I did wear a red tie to uh, honor the, the, the moment. Um, and uh, no, you don't want to see me dance. The uh, so with respect to your question, uh, uh, Margaret, uh, I guess the first issue is the notion of the active purchaser versus the clearinghouse model. And this is something that we did weigh in on. There was a lot uh, with the Selma Conway's bill that we liked. We uh, also agree that a state-based exchange is appropriate, that local market conditions uh, are unique, and that uh, we would be best served by the state rolling out a state-based exchange. Uh, a number of other elements of the bill that we were uh, supportive of. We did have a respectful disagreement on the issue of the active purchaser versus the clearinghouse model. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, it was just this notion of, you know, once an insurance company has met all state and federal regulatory requirements, uh, so you have to meet solvency requirements, network adequacy requirements, um, you have to offer an essential health benefit product that meets one of the metallic tiers, and you meet all those state and, state and federal requirements, is there a role for the exchange to then further vet uh, the options that are available to consumers? Um, we believe that uh, consumers would be best served if that vetting process uh, did not occur at the exchange level. Uh, again, you know, it, it doesn't mean it's a wild, wild west where any product could be offered. You would have to meet all state and federal requirements. It's just does the exchange have a role then in, in further vetting products and saying, you know what, uh, 
you know, based on, I think there's four standards in Assemblyman Conway's bill um, that, uh, that we're going to re restrict uh, uh, this product uh, from the marketplace. I'll give you an example of one area that we've certainly talked about why I don't know that it uh, uh, helps consumers. Uh, there are, um, for example, in Hudson County, there are a number of uh, hospitals now that are contracted only with, say, one, one key plan. Um, if I'm a consumer in that area and the exchange has vetted the product and said, you know, insurance company, your minimum loss ratio or the, the quality or the, the network is not as good, we're, we're going to vet, uh, and, and as part of the vetting process, we're going to say that uh, you, you shouldn't be able to offer your product. Maybe it's more expensive. Maybe it's 10 percent, 15 percent more expensive uh, than other products uh, in that area. But as a consumer in that area, uh, if I'm now screened from getting the plan that I want, that I find value in, um, I don't know that, the, that, that that's sort of the best thing for the consumer. I think there's a, an instinct that this vetting process will drive uh, further um, efficiencies. Um, you know, I, I would note that you know, maybe in some markets there's an argument, uh, a stronger argument to make that. In New Jersey, we are down to, we have five commercial health insurance plans in New Jersey. You know, one honestly is mostly in the uh, self-funded space and in union space, um, and uh, and you also have carriers operating at very high minimum loss ratio requirements. Federal law says 80 cents in the dollar has to be sent on direct claims to consumers uh, or to, to providers, to hospitals, to doctors, to uh, a pharmacy, durable medical equipment, and so forth. New Jersey, for example, in 2009 ran at 89 and a half uh, cents on the dollar was going to directly pay claims and that remaining 10 cents uh, included tax payments, uh, setting up networks, running the systems to collect premium and pay claims and so forth and some level of profit. But uh, um, again, 17 states filed in the United States to say we couldn't possibly meet an 80 percent minimum loss ratio requirement. We're seeking a waiver from the federal requirements. New Jersey's had minimum loss ratio requirements since the early 90s. Uh, and they're running at a sort of much higher level than, uh, than a lot of states. So in that kind of a marketplace, don't know that, uh, that this further vetting process is, is really going to do the, the job that, uh, um, and, and in some cases may take away consumer options that we're concerned about. So you know, certainly one uh, uh, concern we have is that active purchaser concept. The second, and, and, and uh, 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 Chairman Conway mentioned this, was the, um, the board uh, construct. Um, and we would agree that a, a board made up of insurance companies only to regulate the marketplace is, it would be inappropriate. Um, uh, however, we do believe that there's examples in state government where you have multi-stakeholder boards uh, that, uh, that really uh, are a nice model for implementing in an efficient, effective way a regulatory scheme. So, um, and completely agree with Chairman Conaway, the notion that, that there is not going to be a, I mean, Bureaucracy shouldn't be a bad word, and there's going to be a lot of regulations that an exchange is going to have to promulgate to effectuate the program appropriately, and we anticipate that, and, and in many, the, the guidance is necessary for the plans to be able to uh, to do that. But the, uh, um, but our concern there was not that there was a bureaucracy or that it wasn't doing uh, something appropriate. It was, it was that it was uh, if there's conflicting regulatory requirements where you have two state agencies doing the same thing, um, that that's probably not the best. Uh, and, and most efficient allocation of resources. The Department of Insurance looks at rate filings. They look at uh, network adequacy. Uh, they look at a number of solvency. Uh, we would want to make sure that the delineation of authority is clear and that there's not overlapping responsibilities between one regulatory body and the other. That was, that was our concern uh, uh, as, as we move forward. So, you know, again, the active purchaser versus the clearinghouse model, we were supportive of a um, of the sort of more the clearinghouse model and on the board uh, uh, participation, we believe in a multi-stakeholder board where you have hospitals, doctors, uh, insurance companies, brokers, consumers, labor, business, and so forth, uh, contributing their time and donating their time. Uh, and it's going to be a lot of work. We've seen that uh, in when New Jersey's uh, passed the, the Florio reforms in 1992. The first year of those programs were enormous amount of work for uh, folks, and they volunteered their time. You had the AFL-CIO was the chair of the one board. The, the other board was uh, was chaired by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. And we liked that model because it helped um, have uh, um, key stakeholders feel like they were part of that process of building that. 
So you had stakeholder engagement, stakeholder contributions, and you had stakeholders uh, who, who supported the end construct because they were part of the, of the building process. So was a, respectfully, we had disagree with uh, the chairman on that, that particular issue. But again, completely agree that, uh, um, that we should have a New Jersey uh, state-based exchange. And that was the message that was a theme, as many of you know, we hosted um, the Center for State Health Policy had been working with the state over the last two years, the working group to help plan and support the, the um, planning for the Affordable Care Act. And we had hosted 13 stakeholder forums over the last year. And that was a theme that resonated, talking to carriers and brokers and um, employers and consumers that the, the um, exchange should be state-based. And, and that, that was one of the few areas where there was complete consensus that the federal government shouldn't come in and run the exchange for New Jersey. Enrique, let's ask you, if your experience working with other states, um, one of the concerns, I think, in terms of the legislation passing in New Jersey is what is this going to do, if anything, to the timing? And, and um, Chairman Conway uh, alluded to needing to be prepared, and, and it's unlikely that um, this will anything will be resolved before the end of the summer and things will have to heat up in the fall in terms of being prepared to be certified by 2013 um, if in fact that's the course we're moving toward and, and the Supreme Court doesn't completely overhaul everything. Um, what do you see in other states in terms of lessons that New Jersey may learn? Are we on target? How much time does it take? What, what are the critical pieces um, that need to be considered for a timeline? Sure. And am I, am I on? Yep, I am on. Oh. So thanks. Uh, yeah, it, it's very interesting listening to the conversation here because uh, so first observation is certainly while every state is 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 unique, um, the experience that and, and, and sort of the you know what's going on in New Jersey around exchange implementation is is certainly is certainly not unique. Um, so I think um, and I'll talk about this in a minute. But you know while the focus around the country and and, and around you know exchange discussions. Uh, tends to center, uh, or at least the, the, the public focus around technology and the applications of technology. I think getting the governance and the coordination right is is really really critical. Uh, this is not about technology. Technology is simply an enabling set of tools, uh, which actually will feature very prominently in, in the success of the exchange. Uh, but it really is about organization. So in terms of timing, I think at this point, given the the deadlines set forth in the Affordable Care Act. Anybody who is, you know, even folks who are pretty far down the line in terms of their exchange implementation efforts, um, I think are already, you know, on the, pretty much on the critical path. Uh, you know, the, the, the notion that you have to have an exchange fully up and running, um, well, let's, let's call it by October 2013, you know, ready for open enrollment um, is a very, very big lift uh, for, you know, for, for anybody. Uh, if you really think, you know, closely about this, uh, it's requiring a tremendous amount of coordination between agencies that, that typically have, have not worked with each other or not worked well with each other. So, uh, you know, it, it, Medicaid enrollment will be, will be a big issue. Uh, most states, or virtually all states, are going to have to coordinate activities between, uh, between the, the Medicaid side of the world and the private insurance side of the world, whether that's through their departments of insurance or um, you know, or some, you know, some coordinating agency that's set up to run the exchange, which has been the model that we're, that we're seeing around the country. Um, it's a new line of business. So the notion of, of states getting involved in the delivery of commercial insurance is a new line of business for everybody. Uh, so I think the coordination issues are, are huge. Um, and, and then on the system side, um, it's also a big lift. So even though, you know, I said it's not all about technology, there is certainly a, a you know, a, a very, very big technology component. Um, that has to be put in place in order to enable this notion of a, uh, a, a no wrong door, truly seamless approach to an individual or an employer or a small business being able to, to, to learn about, um, compare, and then actually enroll um, in, in coverage uh, with all of the triaging that's going on around that, right? Because we're having to, we're having to triage folks between uh, between Medicaid subsidized coverage um, and, and non-subsidized coverage, um, as well as, as the financial operations that go on in the background um, that are also new to everybody. So things like premium collection, premium aggregation, um, that's, that's, that's all greenfield uh, for states that are setting up exchanges. 
Um, so I think, you know, to, to New Jersey's point, um, I think you're, you're well along the way, uh, or at least you're not, um, you know, you're not, you're, you're, you're in the pack of states that are, that are, that are moving towards state implementation. Uh, you know, we don't know, again, the, the other big issue here is, uh, and you know, to everybody's credit, is that we're operating in, an, in a regime of, of just, you know, pretty significant regulatory uncertainty. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the Supreme Court decision is hanging over everybody. It's, you know, from, from our perspective as, as, as you know, as, as an entity that's working with, with numerous state governments, um, it's a huge distraction. It's taking a long time. Uh, you know, we know we've got 15 states that are, that are, you know, pretty much committed to setting up their exchanges and are moving down that path. Um, a couple of those states like, you know, like Connecticut, um, California have said that they're going to move ahead no matter what happens. Uh, but there are about 22 states that, that are that are you know that are that are sitting and waiting for a Supreme Court decision uh, to to come out, uh, and you know and and independently of the Supreme Court decision uh, being known, there's also uh, there's also we're still waiting for guidance from 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 CMS and from Sasayo, uh, you know, on things like basic health plan. Um, there there are just a number of big missing pieces. Um, that are essential to, to the development of, of, of the exchange. Um, so in terms of what's going on nationally, um, it, it's really, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting environment um, in that, I mean, in my experience, I, I have not seen this kind of um, freewheeling um, activity, you know, in, in my career, having worked in, in, in both in state government and on, on the vendor side. Um, again, we've got, States that are sort of the usual suspects that are moving ahead, and you know we, we know who those are. Uh, but there are a lot of states that are moving ahead that are you know that, that you know that have, that have been surprises to us. So, for example, Alabama is in the middle of a you know really well thought out, really comprehensive um, health insurance exchange procurement effort right now underway. Uh, you know, and they're hoping to you know to get their exchange up and running uh, by October of 2013. Um, you know, states like Rhode Island are, are doing the same thing, very aggressive timeline. They've gotten very good funding. They're the first state to get a level two establishment grant. And, and they're actually using this, this window that's been opened by, by, the Affordable Air, by the Affordable Care Act, not only to, to implement their health insurance exchange, but also to do a, a complete rebuild of their integrated eligibility system. So they're, you know, they're, they're proceeding on a, on, a, on a much larger scale project. Using um, using ACA funding, exchange funding, to um, to set up their exchange, using 90/10 enhanced federal match to rebuild their eligibility system, and and lay the groundwork then for so you know so the the, the sequence will be Medicaid uh, the sequence will be uh, HIX, Medicaid, and then all other health and human service programs by January of of 2015. Uh, so again, you know, to totally different flavor. Uh, folks who are very, you know, sort of conscientious of the of the tight timelines mm -hmm. um, are doing cut down efforts. So Mississippi is, is you know, again, sort of another surprising state, um, setting up a full blown exchange on a fully outsourced basis. So they're going software as a service. You know, sort of the you know the Amazon the Amazon model uh, for um, for insurance exchange, and 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 so is and, and, and so is Nevada. So I think that you know the 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 the, the, the two themes here are, um, in fact, every state is approaching this in a, in a slightly different way, uh, and that's by necessity because there are sp very state-specific needs. Um, you know, insurance markets are very localized. Um, I think there are also some, you know, some common themes that, that, that have emerged, um, you know, and I would characterize those as, uh, you know, the need to get really good coordination across agencies. Um, the need to establish really solid, clear governance around the exchange, and I know that's a challenge again because we're we're grappling with with, with the lack of of um, a final guidance, and then the and then the, the you know the really big one that I think everybody's struggling with, um, and you know and, and it's, it, unfortunately we don't have uh, direct control over this is um, is the deadline risk that's being imposed by uh, by by the by the ACA schedules. Um, you know, I know there's been some discussion at the federal level about whether or not those schedules get modified. Um, 
I think that's, you know, it's a possibility, but it's also tough to do in that the, the deadlines are actually written into the law, so they can't, they just can't be changed administratively. Uh, there has to be some creativity around, uh, around doing that. Uh, and then I think, I think the other, you know, the other issue is, you know, that, 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 that you know, in, in the middle of all this, there's a lot of noise. I mean, you know, you're experiencing it here in New Jersey, uh, which is, which is what's happening, you know, the state house politics that are, you know, that are, that are, you know, that are clearly, um, having a big impact on on timelines. So there was an interesting article in the Washington Post yesterday. Uh, you know, there there are 12 states where where you know sort of the, the internal state house politics are are preventing any movement around uh, around exchange. Even though many of those states, um, and I think New Jersey is actually doing this in a smart way, uh, are are still you know moving ahead with with their with their with their planning efforts. Um, so I think that's the you know the that sort of the, the central theme is. Uh, given the complexity, you know, don't don't wait. Uh, the, the the you know the, the planning effort should be well underway. Um, you know, all the way through. You know, even 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 getting you know draft RFP documents uh, available for for comment and, and and circulation. So I will um, I will stop there. Assemblyman Conway, um, Chairman, would you describe a little bit uh, in terms of our work, the center's work, working with the, the state working group? There are a lot of advances. Many people feel that New Jersey is, is kind of far ahead, particularly with regard to private market reform. So can you comment a little bit on, on where you think perhaps we might be a little bit further ahead in terms of our preparedness to get this moving, um, the, the global waiver with Medicaid? I mean, a lot of things that New Jersey has always been on the forefront of nationally that may put us in, in better position if we have to act quickly. Well, I think some of the changes that uh, are reflected in ACA, many of those things were already here in uh, our own state. We already had those rules in place. Uh, I happen to co-chair um, the uh, National Conference of State Legislatures Task Force on National Health Reform. And interestingly, in Alabama, my co-chair is from Alabama and, and is driving the legislation there. Uh, and we, we, as we talked about these various proposals, I mean, we kept saying, well, New Jersey, we already have that. We, we already have that. So we, we some of this, um, um, I guess the growing pains or the kinds of changes that other states are experiencing, we, we've already been through that process. You know, one of the things I wanted, and just come, listening to Ward's comments, I mean, this bill, and indeed ACA itself, is really not, well, I think people argue this, but we're not going in to change the marketplace around. We're not saying anybody's in, anybody's out, we're sort of setting the rules of the road. And one of the things I, I you know, this, this exchange, you know, if there are rules, not so much about keeping people out, but what happens if people transgress the rules? <laughs> what happens if people, and we have seen this, um, simply don't follow the rules that are laid there, then who is then going to be responsible for ensuring that those rules are enforced? And so it's not a question of keeping people out of the marketplace, and if, and if, if there are efforts to do that, I certainly welcome them and, and we'll discuss them. We would like a more vibrant uh, marketplace for sure. We have too many areas in our state where you have one or two dominant insurers, and, and that doesn't... Uh, uh, in order to the kind of competition you'd like to see to help drive costs down for uh, consumers. But uh, this agency is not um, going to be shutting people out. Somebody has to be there to police the rules. Now, the, health, the essential benefits plan uh, was mentioned. One of the reasons why that's in the bill, and we, we've seen this, uh, certainly where, where I'm going to be heading to work later today, you know, working in a clinic, you have people that, that um, you know, cycle on and off. Their income goes up, uh, they might be eligible for one plan, um, their income goes down, they're eligible for something else. And the question is, do we want to have a, a seamless uh, health insurance system uh, as we can, or one where people are on and they're off and they're on? Now, the hospitals will tell us, and anybody, uh, well, many people who look at uh, how we want to be providing uh, care to needy populations, is you want to sort of maintain stability in their insurance. Uh, when people have insurance, they go to the doctor and get their care in the outpatient space rather than ending up in the hospital for uncompensated care. And so uh, that's why the basic and essential health plan is there. And the governor has some concern about that. But we're going to be spending money uh, in the charity care system where the, uh, anyway. So I would say if we're going to spend money, why not spend it uh, on an insurance product that someone will have so that we don't have discontinuities care, uh, of care and disruption that we know will raise costs. And so that's how come the health benefits, essential health benefits got in uh, to the bill. Um. 
One of the things I would say with regard to the um, basic health plan is currently the center uh, received a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and we're doing an actuarial analysis of revenue and cost on the basic health plan. Again, it's supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, but we are working with the state in terms of um, trying to secure some data from Medicaid that will help inform the modeling. So that analysis will be available in the summer and hopefully can be productive in the discussion. Ward, I wanted to ask you um, with regard to, and, and um, Enrique mentioned the fits and the starts, and, and Chairman Conway obviously talked about the schedule. What does this do for your members, the carriers? And, and we've certainly heard this in the 13 forums that we hosted yeah. last year in our interactions with the carriers. It's full speed ahead. People are working tremendously hard. There are teams set up, deployed within the industry, just focusing on preparing for the implementation. So when the veto comes down last week, where everybody's waiting for the, the Supreme Court decision at the end of June, what's the temperament right now? What's the thought in the, within um, the carriers in terms of full speed ahead, holds up? How do you react? And uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. I think that folks, uh, in some cases, uh, misunderstood this. That the, the, the plans, certainly the, the Supreme Court case <clears throat> and uh, its decision, which I guess we expect in June, is a bit of a distraction. There's probably some contingency planning that the plans are doing, uh, but it is by no means put the brakes on. Um, we uh, in New Jersey, the six health plans that uh, our members of our association have gotten together um, and have spent an enormous amount of time and energy um, you know, putting all those political issues and what the bill says and who's in the board and who pays for it, uh, putting those issues to the side. Um, at the end of the day, the state, the exchange, the federal government is going to have to uh, do a lot of work with the health plans to implement this. So we've been working very hard <clears throat> behind the scenes. We've been meeting with anybody really who's interested in meeting with us to talk about certain issues. We had a, <clears throat> a meeting yesterday um, with state officials on the three R's, right, the risk adjustment, uh, reinsurance and risk corridors, the mitigation programs under the health care reform, uh, you know, the, the reinsurance mechanism alone, um, you know, can be tailored if New Jersey selects a state-based exchange, then it has the ability to somewhat tailor that reinsurance mechanism if it wants to. Um, it's going to have an enormous, if you look at the dollars that are available, um, there's going to be an enormous impact on our individual market uh, in the first couple of years to help, uh, and really a sort of a group to individual market transfer of, uh, of funding and, um, <clears throat> you know, should make individual coverage or at least um, take off some of the bite of plans, uh, folks moving from sort of uh, limited benefit packages to full benefit packages uh, as required under the ACA. That would cost a lot of money, but the reinsurance mechanism, I think, will help flatten that, those costs out. But after three years, it's a temporary program that that funding is, is probably going to go away. Uh, we've worked on enrollment and eligibility and premium collection and uh, a lot of the sort of the backroom operations, there's going to have to be a lot of data that's exchanged between health plans, uh, the state, uh, the exchange, uh, um, you know, there's have to bounce information off the federal hub. Um, and as Enrique mentioned, there's a, you know, there's a lot of regulatory unknowns. So we're charging ahead as best we can to try to get ready so that we're not caught flat footed. Um, you know, we don't need the legislation in place today to work on this stuff, and we're not waiting for it. Um, but there is, you know, the Supreme Court case is certainly a distraction, and, and, uh, and but it's by no means, you know, put the brakes on and wait for the decision to come out. It's, you know, we, we've got to, the plans have spent an enormous amount of money, time, and energy on uh, uh, compliance and, and, and getting ready for this. Yeah, I recall in one of the forums with the carriers that we had last year, we talked about was there a poison pill in you know in terms of their planning that everything stops and and it, it it's too far down the road the the money has been poured in, in terms of IT infrastructure the efforts are, have been so huge over the last two years that it's really uh, it, it can't stop. Um, it, it would be it would be imprudent to stop because we you know uh, the Supreme Court very likely could say you know full steam ahead that you know it, it could it could could strike down portions of it, but still move ahead with the exchange. Um, the exchange is going to play an enormously important and um, uh, role in the facilitation of subsidies. You know, you really need that exchange to be able to, for the individual market to provide those subsidies. So it plays a, a crucial role in that. Um, and there will be some other benefits, I guess, in, in uh, 
um, for other market, like the small group market, to help consumers and employers have a, you know more consistent information to help the the shopping experience. But really, the the, the crucial role is going to be the facilitation of that uh, of that funding. We have to be ready for that. The time frame is short, um, but we're uh, you know I think New Jersey plans are leaders in this. We've shared a lot of information nationally with plans and work that's been developed here in New Jersey. Because our the center's estimate is if this does move forward and the mandate is is upheld that there could be over 440, 450,000 more people in New Jersey who have insurance. So they have to find coverage, and, and obviously the infrastructure has to be there to support the process of enrollment and retention and all of those things. Well, it um, it's, looks like we're about five minutes away from the end of, of our panel, and, and I thought maybe perhaps we'll open it up for some questions, if anybody has questions for the panelists before we um, break. If you can, yes, if you can introduce yourself, please. Good morning, my name is Carolyn Valdichini, and I'm a volunteer with the Unitarian Universalist Legislative Ministry of New Jersey. And we would like to see reforms in any healthcare insurance exchange, and in particular, a reform that um, the healthcare plans are currently against what they're currently doing with the HMOs and the Medicaid. The Unitarian Universalist Legislative Ministry did a study of the, health, the HMOs that serve the Medicaid population. And we used as a control an oncology surgeon, as each of the plans had one. One plan said there were 23 providers, and when you dug in there, there were 13 names. 23 places. Our concern is that there is very greater transparency, and this is why we believe there must be regulation. We would like to know that if one is shopping around for a plan and meets certain needs, a child is diabetic and then a child has health problems, that they're not sidelined by misleading information on the website. That in reality, there are 23 heart surgeons, that that is 23 doctors serving, and that they let us know how many hours we need. And that's one example of why we support. Well, this, um, you know, this has been uh, this question of who's in the network, who's not in. And folks are going to be making decisions. Now, if you don't have insurance, perhaps you don't have a, a well-developed um, idea about who your provider ought to be, but I don't know how many of you have had to purchase insurance, but you know, we are constantly over the years, of my tenure here, sort of looking at ways to help people understand what they're getting. And uh, a lot of people don't know what they're getting. And uh, of course the exchange, one of the rules is that you're going to have to have, uh, you know, list who your providers are, and it's going to have to be there. There's going to be a lot of public uh, uh, ability to find out what's going on with these insurance plans. A lot of it uh, dictated by, uh, the, uh, by the federal government, certainly. But this is where you get into this question of how much help in this active purchase business, how, how um, forward-leaning the exchange ought to be with respect to helping consumers make these critical decisions. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, that's important. We know that there are problems in people understanding what they're getting when they decide on one plan or another, and why, when we have the opportunity here to make, make that process better, why shouldn't we do that? I mean, that's one of the issues I have with this sort of, sort of idea that we go in and do a clearinghouse. We, we sort of, yes, that will be helpful, but consumers are really won't get very much more information than they currently get when you set up that kind of a process, and, and what kind of help and protection they ought to get it, uh, when they're involved in that kind of process. I think there should be a lot of help and protection there, because we know that we are dealing with, uh, with um, I don't know, vulnerable populations, even not, it is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and so why not, if it's out there, people can look at it, we can monitor it, and we can make sure that people are, are actually getting what they think they ought to be getting uh, through this process. Yeah, and just, uh, I mean, it's a, that, come on. Uh, another, I mean, I think to your point, another really you know, Im important aspect of the exchange, you know, beyond technology, there's a, there's a big human dimension. One of the things that, you know, that we've seen in states like Massachusetts uh, is, is the importance, and, and, and other work that we've done is, 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 is the importance of, of really good outreach efforts. Uh, this notion of if you build it, and we're talking now about the, you know, the website, they will come. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of experience around that with, with the delivery of, of self-service um, 
government that has just, especially in the, in the health and human service side, that has not been um, especially successful on a big scale like we need the exchanges to be. Uh, so I, know, I think another, you know, in addition to getting good information, good actionable information via the exchange, um, there's also this notion that, um, that, that, that it's still going to require a, a you know, and, and so, you know, some underpinnings and, and some, you know, some um, facilitated enrollment and, and, and just, you know, search capabilities, um, especially for folks who are, who are hard to reach. Um, you know, the, you have to keep in mind that, 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 that many of the people who are going to be coming in through the exchange have had no experience with, with insurance um, and, you know, the, you know, prior, you know, prior to this. So, um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point. Yeah, just very quickly, the, uh, Enrique mentioned a point that uh, you know, we should, certainly should live uh, or learn from our state-based experience. And I think one of the things we learned uh, from our kid care program, New Jersey Family Care, was that, uh, you know, that it was a constant evolution to help uh, facilitate that enrollment. We went from a multi-page application that I think scared a lot of folks away from, uh, from coverage to a single page, which definitely helped uh, uh, facilitate those enrollments. And we also saw that community-based organizations can play an essential role in helping to, uh, to, to pull people in who don't, you know, aren't, aren't meeting with an insurance broker, for example, uh, in certain areas. If you have, you know, some rural group or inner city group that those, these community-based organizations can really assist in, uh, in facilitating enrollment. Um, the, uh, the question from the person over here, I'm not familiar with the, the report, be happy to, uh, to take a look at that and, and, and look at it. Um, you know, I, I will say that the, um, uh, the chairman's point that you know, the ACA does envision a rating process. So the federal government has set up a rating process where plans will be evaluated and insurance companies will be, I'm not sure how it's gonna work yet, we don't know, but it's gonna be ranked. Um, so, you know, the shopping experience, you know, for, for most employers or individuals is, you know, is what's the cost, uh, you know, who's in the network, um, is my hospital in the network, my doctor's in the network, um, and then some ranking, there's be a lot more transparency about information that's available to consumers about minimum loss ratios and so forth. So uh, I do think that there will be necessarily, even outside the, any state, new state laws, the federal government will be providing more information to consumers in that shopping experience. I think we have time for one more question. You made, uh, made these supportive comments about uh, the importance of outreach and uh, the role that community people need to play. Um, so to your point, um, the state will be essential in, in fostering that kind of support. Funding will be needed and uh, we, need, we need to ensure that government can play a role in, in providing those, those tentacles and, and that level of outreach because it, it will take dollars and where are they going to come from? So it's very good that across the panel here uh, you all made the supportive well, dollars, as you mentioned, that certainly, from my view, in, in the bill, is that the dollars to run the exchange should come from the uh, principals who will benefit most from it, and that are the insurance companies. Now, we get to the question of whether or not, and if the Supreme Court should make a decision with which I am not likely to agree, and we uh, find that uh, much of the ACA is struck down, I think there, there are good reasons to move forward with an exchange. Uh, you know, we have a, a problem with uh, people who don't have insurance, who land in our hospitals, who, um, who make and place our hospitals in a very precarious financial position, and, and we need to find some mechanism to reduce uh, a cost for, uh, of purchasing insurance for those persons so that when people land in the hospital, hopefully they go, rather than land in the hospital, they go see their primary care doctor and get uh, care there uh, more cheaply than it would be in the hospital, and our hospitals then are protected from all these uncompensated care costs. And we spend a lot of money doing that, very inefficient. Uh, what if we were to reprogram that money and run it through an exchange uh, and, and get insurance in the hands? We, when we do as other states have done, as Massachusetts certainly has shown us, and, and move ahead on our, on our own and as other states intend to. The, the exchange idea is one whose time has come and will be helpful, uh, whether uh, and important uh, to uh, the, the healthcare marketplace in states, whether we have federal support to do this or not. Thank you very much, Chairman, and that seems like an appropriate note to end the panel. So thank you very much. Please help me thank the panelists, Chairman Conway, Enrique, and Ward. So thank you very much.